Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, welcome to the Australian National University. On our collective behalf, first of all, let me acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history. My name is Margaret Harding and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research here at the Australian National University. On behalf of the Centre's Director, Jacqueline Lowe, who is presently away on research in Germany, I'm very pleased to welcome you here to the ANU and to its European platform, the Centre for European Studies. This year we celebrate 50 years of formal relations between the EU and Australia. Many events have taken place to mark the occasion, including a Europe Day lecture by Minister Bob Carr at DFAT in May this year. The highlight of the ANU Centre for European Studies program is the Conversation Series, a monthly event where European ambassadors and significant Australians come together to discuss ideas with a senior journalist. These events are recorded by ABC Radio National's Big Ideas program and are also telecast on Sky News. Details and links to podcasts and video links of past conversations are posted on the Centre's website. The Centre is also developing a copy book and video documentary from the series which will be launched next year. Today marks the grand finale of the conversation series which has been one of the most innovative outreach programs that we are very proud of here at the ANU. Given the attention that this series has received, you will be pleased to know that the series and the Centre for European Studies has been nominated for the ANU Media Award, the winner of which will be announced this week by the Vice-Chancellor. I'm very pleased to welcome back Paul Barclay as the mediator of this final conversation. Paul is presenter and series producer of Big Ideas on ABC Radio National. Prior to this role, he was presenter of Australia Talks for six years and has, he has produced countless stories for many programs on most ABC radio networks, as well as appearing on ABC TV. And when circumstances permit, he has produced radio documentaries for ABCN Radio National's background briefing. I'll now hand over to Paul to introduce our distinguished speakers today. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. It's terrific to be here for the final in our series of EU discussions uh, for Big Ideas on Radio National. Today's discussion, as you've heard, is being recorded for broadcast. It will air on RN this Thursday night at 8 p.m. and will be available for broadcast uh, via download on our website at abc.net.au slash Radio National. The entire series of conversations from this year can be heard uh, if you missed one or if you want to catch up with them on our special EU website. Uh, I want to thank the ANU and the Centre for European Studies for hosting uh, not just today's event but all of the events throughout the year. They've been very generous hosts to us, to me, throughout the year. I've enjoyed coming back here very much indeed. I hope if circumstances permit that we can work again in the future. Uh, we've been commemorating throughout this year and throughout these talks the 50-year milestone of the commencement of relations between the European Union and Australia. And we've used this anniversary as an opportunity to delve into the EU, its history, uh, the, his the, the history of the relationship, and the pressing issues facing it and its member nations. It's been a revealing and stimulating series for me personally and the conversations have been a terrific addition to the Big Ideas catalogue for this year. Uh, thanks to Roger Camilleri and all of the people at the delegation of the European Union to Australia for their support this year without which this series would not be possible. And before I go any further I, I should say, and most of you will know this, uh, the European Union is the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, congratulations for that. I'm glad we uh, chose to back a winner early in the year in that regard. Um, the EU is Australia's 
second largest trading partner after China and our largest trading partner in terms of services. I hope I'm right there. I'll be corrected, no doubt, if I'm not. Um, how has our economic and cultural relationship developed over the decades? Is the EU as strategically important to Australia as it once was? Uh, today we have representation from two countries that have played a vital role in the development of Australia, uh, the UK for all of the obvious reasons, and Italy, whose migrants helped shape contemporary post-war Australia and have contributed immeasurably to our vibrant multicultural country. As a Victorian myself and someone who spent many, many years living in Carlton uh, in my university and post-university days, I don't know what I would have done living in that part of uh, Australia if the Italians hadn't arrived after the war. Um, it's been a, a, a... Well, I know my city of, of Melbourne has just been transformed by it. With no further ado, though, let me welcome today's esteemed guests on my left. Or, no, actually, uh, third to my left. Uh, His Excellency Mr David Daly, Ambassador of the European Union and a more consummate advocate for the EU you will not find anywhere. Um, right next to me, His Excellency Mr Paul Madden, High Commissioner of the United Kingdom. Next to Paul, His Excellency, and I'll do my best here, Mr Jean Ludovico Di Martino di Montegiordano, Ambassador of Italy. I apologise for that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, and at the very end, Australia's Parliamentary Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Richard Miles, representing Australia's Foreign Minister. We have uh, plenty to get through. Uh, will you please make them all welcome? Uh, Paul Madden, Australia and the UK obviously have shared one of the closest international relationships because of our shared history, our culture, our language. Would you say that the link today is more cultural and social and less economic as Australia's economic focus shifts to Asia? No, I, as you say, we have a very long-standing historical relationship, but I think the relationship today continues to be a, a vital one and a relevant one to the 21st century. If you look at the fields of defence, and intelligence, foreign policy, we work incredibly closely together. Australia is one of our strongest ally. Our military engage together in places like Afghanistan. If you look at the economic side, we are the second largest investor in Australia. Australia is now a major investor in the UK, important trading relationship too. And then at the people to people level, not least because of that history, a, a million and a half Australians have British passports, a million Australians visit Britain every year. And because of those people to people flows, there's a huge cultural uh, connection. Mm. We play cricket, occasionally Britain, <laughs> occasionally England wins, usually Australia does. We laugh at the same jokes. It's a very close relationship and very much a 21st century one. How would you characterise the change that the relationship has gone through though, as, as Australia has become a more independent nation? How has that changed the relationship with the UK? Well, I think for both of us, we are orientated in a number of different directions. So I don't think Australia has to make a choice between Asia and Europe. I don't think Britain has to make a choice between EU and some of the other countries that it has long-standing ties with mm. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, some of the countries uh, which have generated large people-to-people -people flows uh, to, to the UK. So I, I don't think in the world we live in, it's, it's necessary to say that to increase your links with one country, you have to diminish them with another. Mm. Richard Miles, the final constitutional ties between the UK and Australia ended in 1986 with the Australia Act. Since the Second World War, though, the perception has been that we've moved closer to the US and that today we are moving closer to Asia and to China. What does Australia's historic relationship with the UK mean today? Well, firstly, uh the, the relationship with the United Kingdom is, is very much a, a, a large part of our history. Just as you articulated the, the constitutional relationship, uh, it, it, that is a relationship specifically with the UK. Mm. Um, the, the events that occurred during the Second World War and, and certainly uh, Curtin's speech in, in looking to the US, but the, it was actually uh, legislation which was passed during that year, the Statute of Westminster, um, which was all about our constitutional arrangement with, or our relationship with uh, the UK. 
So, so the, I think the first point to make is that there are deep, deep historical ties. And as Paul said, um, w what comes with them is an, an awful lot of cultural ties. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, cricket I I is part of it. But I, but I think you're right. We do laugh at the same jokes. And there is uh, large communities uh, in large Australian communities in Britain, large British communities here. Um, so all of that is still very contemporary and very relevant. But the other point that Paul made is, is absolutely right. Going forward, um, this is a strong economic relationship. I, in some ways, it and, and also the, the economic relationship with Europe is, um, you know, it's almost a, a bit of a sleeper, which is an odd term to use, and I don't mean by that that it is a sleep, but what I mean is that we, we focus a lot on, on Asia, we focus a lot on America, but if you actually look at the EU, uh, as you rightly said, our second biggest trading partner, our largest investor, um, the, the UK is, is, is the largest component of that. Mm. Um, that's a very important part of our future. And, and I, I guess the final point is we have very similar international reflexes. We mm. are very strong allies. We are in the same places and the same issues in the world. And by and large, we take the same positions and work very closely. Paul made the point that we don't need to choose between uh, Britain and Asia or in the in the case of the United States, United States or Asia, but your government's just released the Asian White Paper, which is very much a wake-up call about genuine engagement with Asia. It's about truly mm. understanding that part of the world, making more of an effort in terms of Asian languages, comprehending the culture. Can we do that? Can we apply ourselves to that effort, to understanding that part of the world more without it necessarily meaning that some of that historical baggage will fall by the wayside with the uh, UK? Absolutely we can. Uh, Australia in the Asian Century White Paper is, is nothing more or less than, than saying we live in uh, one of the fastest economic growing regions in the world. Um, we are going to witness a huge social phenomena in the development of the Asian middle class in China and in India and in, in the ASEAN countries. We need to position ourselves to take best advantage of that. Mm. Now, I don't think we're alone in that. Um, that we've done an Australia in the Asian Century White Paper. Um, that they're you may well see Britain do a mm. Britain in the Asian Century white paper in the sense that everybody is going to be thinking about how do you position yourselves best to deal with this uh, rise of Asia. But that doesn't then uh, say that that's the whole global story. It's, it, it's not. And I think mm. that there are a lot of opportunities going forward that we have with Europe. Um, and, and the economic relationship is very much a part of that. I mean, from my point of view, and, and having visited Europe a number of times this year, it, it does strike me that we have uh, very significant European communities, diasporas in Australia. Um, we ought to be, I think, using them a bit more in terms of building the relationships with the, the, the countries of Europe. And, and that, I reckon, is a great opportunity for Australia. Mm. So I, I think that we will see um, the growth of both relationships, and I don't think it is uh, having to choose between one or the other. Mm. I think, David, you wanted to make a point here. Yeah, just a, a, a couple of points linking in with what Paul and, uh, and Richard have said. Um, the first thing is that uh, I spend a lot of my time in Australia um, with Australians, uh, educating them on uh, what those European countries that they know very well are all about, Italy, Germany, the UK and so on, what European countries have agreed to come together to do <coughs> as the European Union. That's, that's something which sometimes is missing and I, and I agree with Richard that sometimes the, the, the European Union as such is sort of sleeping on uh, there. It's it's sort of there in the, not quite in the in the foreground, but um, people Australians are more aware of the individual countries of Europe rather than what we've agreed to to do together. Mm. Uh, another point I'd like to make is is um, in terms of the European Union, um, the European Union exists because of its member states, and because of its member states, we have a rich history, rich traditions. We have many interests all over the world. Mm. And to talk of the, the great British history and, and range of interests, uh, this time last year, uh, Australia hosted the, the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Mm. And it was a wonderful uh, opportunity also at the EU level for the, uh, the EU foreign minister, if you like, for, for Baroness uh, Cathy Ashton to come to Australia mm. and to have meetings uh, also in the context of the Commonwealth Heads of Government. This is something which is not unnatural for her to do, 
uh, given the history of the Commonwealth mm. and given the place of Britain as, uh, as a member state of the European Union. So I just want to yes. make that linkage. John, I will come to you in a moment. If I can just follow up, uh, Paul, the, the visit of William Hague uh, last year was the first by a serving British Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Secretary in 20 years, I think. He said the British government wanted to reconnect with Australia and begin a new era of bilateral relationships. What, what will this new era look like? And was he acknowledging in some way that there'd been some slippage in the relationship? Well, I think one of the challenges of a relationship that's incredibly strong, <laughs> that, that, that goes for not just for UK, Australia, but for Europe, Australia, is that we sometimes just take each other for granted mm. and focus on the things that are new. Um, and the fact that we hadn't had a foreign minister visit for, for some years doesn't mean they didn't talk, because Australians tend to go through Europe very mm. regularly, so they've met there, and foreign ministers meet all the time nowadays at big international events. Um, and we've had prime ministers come through rather more regularly. Mm. Um, the relationship uh, is spearheaded at the moment by a process we have which is called AUKMIN, the Australia-UK Ministerial Meeting, and Hague will be back again in January, um, together with the Defence Secretary, um, meeting Bob Carr and Stephen Smith, and they'll be talking about a whole range of things, but a lot of them will be the kind of things that you started off by talking about, about um, the, the shared challenges and opportunities of the rise of Asia, mm. um, the Indian Ocean, because that's an important area too. Mm. The meeting's going to be in Perth, and so uh, in the Indian Ocean will loom quite large, but all sorts of issues around terrorism and other issues that we deal with together. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Jeanne, as I said, Italians came to Australia in large numbers after the Second World War. Uh, there are now subsequent generations of, Itali of Australians with Italian heritage. They've helped to shape our country in, in many ways. How close are the two countries today, do you think? We've got an excellent relationship. Mm. Um, we, uh, we share the same values. Mm. I mean, we are engaged with the same challenges. Also, we work closely, cooperate closely in all international fora. And uh, the community we have of Italian background is actually an asset in our relationship mm. because we've got it's about uh, one million people according to the last census that are of Italian origin and they are uh, well represented in uh, politics in, in uh, industry in business in the arts in academia in all in, in, in all ways of life mm. but then uh, our history is actually back quite a lot uh, to the 17th century I mean we had uh, mm, uh, one of the first maps of Australia was drawn by an Italian Dominican in, uh, in Manila. He actually even pro he wrote a letter to the Pope proposing to establish a colony in what is today Western Australia. Mm. And the letter took 10 years to get to Rome and to get an answer. <laughs> in the meantime, he had passed away. <laughs> Otherwise, one might have had some, you know, some venture <laughs> there in the mid 17th century. And also, at the time uh, of the discussions on uh, what to do with the new continent, there was mm. uh, 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 an Italian who it was of Italian origin, but always sort of proud of his Italian uh, background, uh, Matra, who uh, advised on the uh, uh, on what to do. I mean, he came up with some ideas. I mean. Uh, 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 hence Matraville near Sydney is named after him. Mm. So I mean, we have had a, a connection mm. from the beginning, let's say, of the uh, uh, presence here, I mean, of the colonization. And then the great uh, sort of uh, uh, boost to immigration was after World War II, as you said, when we had about mm. 700,000 people moving here to Australia. Why did they come to Australia after the Second World War? Well, what, was, what, what, was, what was it they sought? from Australia? Well, it was a land of opportunity, you know, because after World War II, difficult times, I mean, there were mostly people who were uh, uh, back in Italy engaged in agriculture, and there was a transition from, to new forms of agriculture, which of course affected, I mean, also the, the possibility of employment, and so uh, uh, we had uh, uh, quite a large immigration from Italy, which uh, uh, took uh, several directions. I mean, some went to, to other European countries, mm. others went to Australia, to, to America, South America. That was the main motive, mm. really. It, it was driven by economic uh, sort of factors. When you came to Australia as ambassador, were you surprised by the extent of Italian influence in Australia? Or did you know, did you, well, did you expect it to be as it is? Well, I, I knew it was there, but I mean, mm. you really have to get to a place to find out what yeah. it's like. And yeah. I mean, just to, I mean, the fact that there are 320,000 
uh, uh, students in Australian schools that are actually learning Italian. Mm -hmm. So Italian is the second, uh, uh, it's still the second uh, 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 more widespread language taught in schools after English. I mean, that's significant. I mm -hmm. mean, it's really, uh, probably we don't have uh, an example like that in other places. It's mm -hmm. I want to look now at the role of the UK within the EU. And at this point, I'm, if you'll indulge me, going to play something that might assist us with understanding that's something that you'll all be familiar with. This is pro-Europe because it is really anti-Europe. The civil service was united in its desire to make sure that the common market didn't work. That's why we went into it. What are you talking about? <laughs> Minister, Britain has had the same foreign policy objective for at least the last 500 years to create a disunited Europe. In that cause, we have fought with the Dutch against the Spanish, with the Germans against the French, with the French and Italians against the Germans, and with the French against the Germans and Italians. Divide and rule, you see. Why should we change now, when it's worked so well? <laughs> Ancient history, surely. Yes, and current policy. We had to break the whole thing up, so we had to get inside. We tried to break it up from the outside, but that wouldn't work. Now that we're inside, we can make a complete pig's breakfast of the whole thing. <laughs> Set the Germans against the French, the French against the Italians, the Italians against the Dutch. The Foreign Office is terribly pleased. It's just like old times. <laughs> Surely we're all committed to the European ideal. Really, Minister? <laughs> not. Why are we pressing for an increase in the membership? Well, for the same reason. It's just like the United Nations, in fact. The more members it has, the more arguments it can stir up the more futile and impotent it becomes. Appalling cynicism. <laughs> yes. We call it diplomacy. <laughs> uh, interesting listening back to that, actually, um, uh, not just because it's so amusing, but it does remind us of how much has changed. Um, but I wonder if one thing hasn't changed, Paul, how, how conflicted the UK is in its relationships with the European Union. Well, I did say at the outset that we laughed at the same jokes. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, when I first saw Yes, Minister, I didn't realise it was a comedy. I thought it was a, a documentary series. But, um, um, if you look at some of the reasons why we joined Europe in 1973, um, a, a little after its original foundation, the generation of politicians who took us in then were a generation who, in their, their education and their formative years, had the experience of the, the, the terrible devastation of the Second World War. And that was a hugely important... Um, for many of that generation who founded Europe. And I think the peace and stability that that has led to is something mm. that everyone in the UK would certainly um, endorse as a, a key element of the European Union. More recently, the wave of enlargement, particularly when we had a, a large wave of enlargement to the Eastern European countries, which helped embed in those countries democracy, free markets as they emerged from the, the shadow of communism. I think we would see that also a, a, a huge success mm. um, of the European Union. We'd also say that the single market has been a, a, a great success, which has benefited not just European business, but European consumers as well. Mm. And then there are a whole series of global challenges where we think we work better together than we would do individually. So uh, addressing the challenges of climate change would be a good example of that. Mm. And some areas of foreign policy, and in general, uh, foreign policy collaboration works very well in Europe on mm. issues where, where we're all agreed. So I think there are lots of um, aspects of Europe which, uh, for, for which you would find a great deal of support that in the UK. That is true, but is the UK stepping back from Europe in other important respects? The European Act of 2011, for example, uh, new powers given to Parliament, a referendum lock so that any transfers of powers from the UK to the EU can now only happen with the express consent of the British people, would indicate a certain reluctance to become more European? Well, I think it's clear that neither the British government nor the British people, and indeed, I think many citizens in different European countries don't share an objective of an ultimate integration into a single federal country. We like mm -hmm. a Europe of, um, of, members, of nation states. I think going forward, you're going to see a, a whole series of different areas where in some areas countries work closer together and in some areas they don't. So if you take the... Um, the Eurozone, for example, we didn't become a member of the, um, the, the monetary union because we, it was clear to us that the, the ultimate consequence of monetary union is that you're going to have to have closer fiscal and banking union. Mm. And so that was an area that we didn't want to go in. 
Um, as it happens, it's, uh, it's rather useful to our economy now that we have the independent currency. But we certainly wish the Eurozone well, because 40% of our exports go to the Eurozone. A sense of vindication, if, perhaps, of uh, not joining the Euro all of those years ago? Well, there's, there's absolutely no schadenfreude in it at all, because we want the, European, we want the Eurozone to, to succeed. Um, but there are other areas where, actually, the UK is, is at the forefront of pushing some of the EU's policies. So if you look at some of our foreign policy engagements, uh, for example, in Libya, uh, in Syria, it's the UK, al along with um, uh, France, which is right at the forefront of the European pact. So I mm. think you're going to see what, what the academics call a variable geometry. I don't think it's as simplistic as you sometimes hear people talk about an inner core and an outer core. Mm. I think it's going to be different countries will collaborate at closer levels of integration in some areas and less close in others. Mm. Uh, David Daly, do you think that there is a different understanding of the state and sovereignty in Britain to what there is in the EU generally, that the EU has increasingly been about expanding its sphere of political, economic, cultural influence at, at the same time as the UK perhaps is expressing more and more reservations about that. I note the point. I'm not sure whether the ultimate ambition is uh, the EU as a, as a federated, uh, you know, a number of federated states or not. But uh, do you think you are, are, are the, uh, UK and the EU moving in the same direction, I suppose, is what I'm asking. I would say uh, yes, they are moving in the same direction. Um, I think that we have to be very careful about uh, simplistic uh, terminology. Um, and we have to be very careful about um, trying to describe uh, the end state of European integration. Mm. Um, if you ask what is the end state of European integration, then I think you will get 27 and next year 28 when Croatia joins. Mm. You will get 27 different official definitions of the end state. Mm. And if you put the question more broadly, you will get over 500 million different uh, definitions from each and every European citizen. So we have to be careful about, about um, trying to predict, trying to exactly describe the end state. Um, that's something that we're very bad at. What we're very good at is being able to see the essential value that Paul has outlined, the essential value for us all in furthering our national interests by doing more things more closely together. Mm -hmm. And that can vary uh, from issue to issue. It can vary from, from member state to member state. But that is the fundamental truth. Mm -hmm. And that aspect of what we call the pooling of sovereignty, accepting that, yeah, when, when a, a new area comes to the EU table, member states know that they're giving up a portion of their ability to control every single aspect of that area for them alone. That portion is put on the table and it is pooled with everybody else. Mm. But equally, people know that that is a trade. And in exchange, you get an input in how we collectively deal with that policy issue. Mm. And that is uh, at the essence. Now, has that been misunderstood? I would argue very strongly that that has been understood in Britain from the very beginning. I mean, if you read the speech of Winston Churchill to the Hague uh, uh, conference in 1948, he describes perfectly what the pooling of sovereignty is and how it involves um, a certain amount of sacrifice for a greater good in which mm. you fully participate. If you read um, uh, Ted Heath's, uh, Prime Minister Ted Heath's uh, speeches arguing in the 60s uh, and, and in the 70s for British accession. There is no doubt about this aspect having been understood. Mm. But I think that like in all member states, there is an important job for us to do to have a proper political discussion with our uh, citizenry about the European mm. Union. John. David mentioned their sacrifice for the common good. Uh, that brings to mind the measures coming out of Brussels now, the austerity measures coming out of Brussels now being imposed upon countries like Italy. How pro-Europe 
are the Italians at the moment? I don't think there is an issue there. I mean, we are one of the founding members of the European mm -hmm. Union. Even before, I mean, if you look at the development of the, the philosophy which then led to the uh, 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 to the construction, I mean, to the building of Europe. I mean, we have had uh, 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 already during World War II, I mean, there was the manifesto for a federalist Europe, which was launched in Ventotene by Altiero Spinelli, who was one of the uh, uh, fathers, I mean, of Europe. So th th there is quite a, a, a widespread and well-rooted uh, European sentiment. And the uh, sort of measures which have been adopted by our government since uh, 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 November 2011 have. Of course, there is always a discussion, there is a debate, there are mm. sort of uh, positions of criticism and so on, but uh, the vast majority, I mean, which is supporting the government, I mean, has uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, approved them. Mm. One, one of the themes we keep coming back to in this discussion is support for Europe at an official level and that those people in government and in an official capacity understanding the importance of Europe as the solution to the problems that Europe now faces so that more Europe is much more of a solution to the problem than less Europe but I suppose the question I was asking you is do you think the citizens of Italy and maybe similar Mediterranean countries accept accept that proposition as well given that they're having to swallow the bitter austerity pill at the moment? I would say that generally, I mean, even you, you can just look at the news and so on. We haven't had any sort of uh, e explicit or sort of vast sort of movements. There have been some, uh, you know, uh, some criticism, but I mean, it's generally understood and mm. subscribed to. Mm. Richard Miles, I wonder how Australia views this from, I suppose, the theoretical standpoint, really, of, of, of looking at how nation states sit within a supranational identity. Uh, how, how, do, how do you view it? Does this in principle enhance or reduce democracy perhaps as, as we'd understand it as Australians? Well, uh, the, the starting point is that we are interested observers uh, in this. These are obviously matters which are going to play out in, in Europe as uh, the member states of the EU decide. But having said that, we very much feel the European project is a good thing. Um, mm more integration is a good thing. Um, undermining uh, the common market in Europe we would see as being, a, would be a bad direction. So that's the, the basic way in which we would uh, come to this question. But I think there are really three things to say. Um, firstly, that if you look at um, peace, it, 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 there is no doubt that Europe has been an incredible project in terms of maintaining peace within a continent which was wracked by war for a long time. And many Australians, thousands of Australians, lost their lives in European wars. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the second issue is the spreading of democracy. Uh, I, I spent, uh, I was in Croatia uh, earlier in the year where uh, Croatia, as uh, David said, will be the next member state of the EU. And you look at the steps that Croatia is going through, and it's a very impressive country indeed, um, in order to gain accession to uh, the EU. And uh, gaining European Union membership is a wonderfully positive thing for that country, as it will be for Serbia and, uh, and Montenegro and the other countries of the uh, Balkan region, and indeed other parts of Europe who seek membership of it. So mm. in, in that sense, it's, it's a great thing. But the third point is, is really around trade. We are fundamentally a, a free trade country. So much of our economic future is based upon our ability to trade with and engage in the world economically. And so when we see this grand project of integration, I mean, that is something that we're on the sides cheering for, because uh, that can only be a good thing mm. in terms of seeing global trade. And <coughs> excuse me, but I I if you look at the practicalities of that, and Croatia is a good example of it, you know, when you, when, you, when you drill down into the nitty gritty of Australian bilateral trade with Croatia, that will be vastly improved once we see Croatia in the European Union, because mm. there are a whole lot of uh, measures around customs and, and other uh, things which will make it much easier for uh, businesses to invest in Croatia from Australia and for that trade to occur. So, and, that's gen and that's generally the case, is it, with European nations that when they join 
the, the European Union, that it enhances Indeed. trade opportunities with Australia. That, that's absolutely right. And, and uh, you, you know, like I've, I've been in uh, uh, Albania as well during the year, and, and there is a great desire to see a growing relation, a growing economic relationship between Albania and Australia. Um, it, it would be a long-term aspiration of Albania to join the EU. That 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 is clearly a step in the right direction in terms of improving trade. So, uh, so from that perspective as well, uh, greater integration is something that we see as being a positive. But this is a you know, for, for any observer of international uh, affairs, this is a, a, a wondrous experiment which is going on in Europe and we all watch it with enormous interest and inevitably there are going to be steps forward and steps back and, um, and we, you know, we are very supportive of it but we you know, watch with enormous interest. Um, David, I'd like yes. to, to come in on, on that. Um, it is a wonderful project. As you <laughs> observe it, we live it yeah. and for us it is something really magical. Uh, for the reasons that you've outlined. On the trade front, um, this is an area which uh, over a long period of our 50 years relationship with Australia, it has been an area of conflict where we've been shouting at each mm, other for various true. reasons. This is over, yeah. this is finished. Mm. Um, yes, we still have our common agricultural policy, but no, today our common agricultural policy is by and large fully trade compliant and the areas that are still trade irritants like export subsidies or or uh, some of the high tariffs, these are points that we've explicitly <coughs> put on the table of the Doha round of trade negotiations. Now, at that point, you see not only a great success for the Cairns Group led by Australia, but you also see how uh, today, Australia and the European Union together are at the forefront of trying to breed life back into mm. the Doha round. I'm glad you brought that up because this is also in historical series that we're uh, providing and we're looking back as, as well as forward. And uh, Richard, Australia's relations with the EU, particularly from that agricultural standpoint, were at first dominated by tensions, weren't they? And um, the EU was perceived initially as a threat, so much so that I'll remind you that the Deputy Prime Minister at the time, Doug Anthony, called the EU the aids of the agricultural community. Um, we have moved forward somewhat since that period. Yeah, very yeah well, a very, very different uh, government. Different uh, language, uh, too. Uh, 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 <laughs> definitely different language as well. Um, look, there, there have been, been those issues in the past. Um, and, and they, and, 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 I mean, you, you raise that as an example of the heat that was in that issue at the time. Uh, but what David said is right. You know, we are very much moving forward and, and it is uh, a relationship in terms of trade that we're seeking to expand. And, and we do, I, I said earlier that I think we have very similar reflexes on global issues. I think we do have very similar reflexes on trade issues now uh, as well. And we've just, uh, we're currently negotiating a framework agreement with, um, uh, which we want to establish at a treaty level with the European Union. That was one of the uh, third, well really almost the first uh, initiative that Prime Minister Gillard put in place in her first meeting or visit to Europe as mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, we've gone through four rounds of negotiation about that. And that really is about trying to take the relationship beyond those issues of the past. Are um, things moving as quickly as you would like to see I in terms of opening up uh, and pulling down some of those trade barriers? Yes, I, th I think they are. And, and uh, you can always, with trade, look at um, what needs to be done and look at irritants and issues that need to be overcome. But if you uh, take the perspective of the glass half full, there's just no doubt that there has been enormous advances uh, in relation to that. And, and I think we're seeing that flow through in a very practical way. L last week we had the Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs from, uh, from Italy lead a, uh, a delegation to Australia of I think some 30 strong who, who were looking at ways in which there can be investment by Italian companies into uh, Australia and particularly in relation to Australian infrastructure. Um, this is a great step forward and, and it's the kind of, uh, I think, uh, economic relationship that we hope to foster in the future with, with Europe, which mm. goes back to the, 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 the question you asked earlier about does it compete with Asia? The answer is no. We, we, we can do all of it. And, and as a country with a small market, being Australia, um, but with, with good skills and good smarts, it is in our interest to be engaging as deeply as possible with the major markets of the world, and Europe is, you know, is very much first among them.
Mm. And Jana, are you seeing a more concerted effort being put in uh, to a, a greater Italian economic uh, relationships with Australia? Is there, a, is there a push from your country to get more of an economic state or have more of an economic relationship with Australia? Yes, I mean, our, we are actually the 12th uh, uh, exporter to Australia and the third uh, Euro among European countries. Our trade has been growing uh, uh, over the past two years, every year, steadily. And uh, uh, we have, uh, over four years, Italian companies have been awarded contracts in infrastructure and uh, energy and resources projects. Uh, I mean, in both public and private uh, sort of contracts for over $11 billion. Mm. So uh, we have got quite uh, a significant relationship, which is growing, and uh, our uh, business community in Italy is aware of the opportunities of Australia, also as a platform to form joint ventures with Australian companies, looking also at the wider uh, uh, region, I mean, or the Asia-Pacific. Mm. Asia Asia Pacific. Mm. Uh, yeah. We're seeing it the other way as well. We've, um, Westfield are now, uh, investing in Milan, where we, uh, with a Italian partner, which will see the biggest shopping mall in Europe, uh, in Milan, uh, Australians investing in uh, in Italy in that way. So it's a good example of how the the, the flow of, of money and trade is going in both directions. Uh, Paul, to what extent is the Australian UK economic relationship mediated through the EU, and to what extent is it just a bi a pretty much straight up bilateral relationship? Well, in terms of trade policy, then it's done through the EU because the EU represents uh, Europe on trade policy issues, so both bilaterally and um, on the multilateral scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps I could say on, on the overall trade scene, in some ways I think we're all disappointed that the world collectively hasn't made more progress on the Doha round, not least because the principal beneficiaries would have been the developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, in the absence of that, I think what's happened now is that there's a, a renewed interest in more uh, region to region and country to country agreements which we're all pushing ahead with. And I think it's important that as we do that, we do it in a way that makes the wider scene more open rather than less open. Mm. Um, in terms of our um, bilateral trade relationship, I mean, that, that results in the decisions made by millions of individual citizen consumers and hundreds of thousands of companies. Mm. But it's very strong. Our exports to Australia in my first year here were up 32%. Sadly, I wasn't on commission. But, <laughs> but uh, we've got two enormous Westfield stores in London. If you went to the Olympic Stadium in East London, as you left the station, you'd have to walk through a cunningly positioned Westfield Mall <laughs> to get there. Uh, David Daly, when do you think was the point at which Australian-EU relations turned around from that, from that sort of lowish ebb where there was a degree of tension and scepticism to... <laughs> Was, was, it, was it around the 90s when things started to improve between the Australia and the EU, would you say? Well, I'm not sure that you can point to a very specific event or a specific moment, but um, to, to a, a series of different things. I think uh, in, the, in the 90s, I think there were a number of very important uh, processes that, that really started to kick in. Um, one was... Uh, the, the starting of a very serious rolling reform of the agricultural policy of the EU. Mm. This is one. Second was the um, negotiation of the Uruguay trade round, um, which brought agriculture into the, the GATT. Um, and that, uh, that, I think, was, a, was an important moment. Um, other parts of the 90s, in terms of the European Union, um, we had the tragedy of the, of the Balkan Wars, which uh, Richard alluded to uh, a moment ago in relation to Croatia and other countries. Um, and one of the political reactions of the European Union to that was to really begin to get our act together much more seriously in the foreign policy area. Mm -hmm. And we gave ourselves uh, new instruments, and there was a, a, a new uh, political commitment, I would say, uh, to that. Now, that has gone leaps and bounds. And because it has uh, gone so well, of course, the union today is a very different union from in the past, because mm -hmm. we are a global player that has far more tools in our toolbox than we used to have. Okay. So the uh, as, as we progressively began to use some of these instruments, I mean, 
replacing NATO soldiers in Bosnia or in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia uh, with European Union uh, soldiers. Uh, this was something incredible, something that people said would never ever happen. Um, but by virtue of being able to do these things, I think that we have shown to ourselves firstly, but also to our global partners, uh, and in this case, Australia, we have demonstrated that we are much more of a player than we used to be. But I would see all of this as a, as, as a, as a process. Then there have been individual milestones. I mean, uh, breakthroughs in, in, in uh, agreements in the scientific area or in research mm. and, and development, uh, in, in education. Uh, these things... Moving have, have beyond agriculture, really. Moving beyond agriculture. Mm. I mean, there were things that we were doing anyway, but which we were blinded about because mm. we were just in the glare of agriculture, mm. which was blinding us to the other things we should, we were doing progressively and which we should be doing more of. Yes, because development assistance is a, is a, yeah, is a really good example yeah, of that. Yeah. We, we are uh, close partners now in, in relation to that and, and seeking to have arrangements where we, we have delegated cooperation. In other words, uh, we provide the EU with money which they effectively spend in places like Africa where they've got expertise and the reverse happens in terms of EU money being provided to Australia which we then work with in places like the Pacific makes sense, mm. um, but we are, but it can only be done because of the closeness of the relationship and, and again this sort of similarity of, of, of global reflexes that we have um, and there is a, I think that does help uh, mm. build the relationship and in, in the Pacific for example, the, the EU is a, is a huge player, I mean obviously Australia is a huge player in the Pacific but the EU mm. is as well and so we work very closely together and if you were to look at the uh, the development cooperation that goes on within the Pacific, a large part of that story is the relationship between Australia and the EU. Mm. Absolutely, and I would just add uh, another area is climate change. Uh, Paul mentioned oh. it uh, uh, at the beginning. I mean, uh, this is a clear area where none of us can solve the problem on our own. Mm. And we need to work together. And with whom can you work? You can work best with partners who share your values, share sh similar perspectives and so on. Mm. And I think the EU and Australia have, have been demonstrating this in recent years very and, strongly. And on that, Paul, there, there is absolutely no doubt that the the, the uh, arrangements that have now been put in place where the carbon pricing scheme that we have in Australia will be integrated into the, the scheme which exists in Europe uh, is going to have a huge impact on the overall uh, relationship between Australia and, and Europe. This is, this is a huge step forward um, and, and really does represent, the, in, in a way, the next chapter in terms of our relationship. Paul, when I spoke with the French and German ambassadors on this very stage in March of this year, they were enthusiastic in their support for greater political and social integration of the EU. The EU was one political and social unit, essentially. That's not the British approach, though, is it? It would be fair to say that you hold a very different view of where the EU is heading in the future? Yeah, as, well, as I've said, we there will be lots of different depths of integration in different areas. Um, I think if you ask the ordinary citizen, and not just in the UK, I guess Australians get a lot of their perspective on the debate among the public in Europe through the, the access to, the, Europe, to the, the, the British media. But actually, if you were reading some of the European media, you'd see that some of those debates are fairly live too. Mm. And I think there is a bit of a disconnect between the EU and its institutions and the ordinary citizen. Mm. Um, and I think we all bear some responsibility for that. And if you look at the, um, the voting turnouts, for example, in the, um, the European Parliament elections, that would suggest that people aren't as engaged in the democratic process as they might be. Mm. So I think there are important um, levels of education and engagement. But I think also that uh, governments need to look at precisely where the boundaries of the EU lie, whether they're where individual citizens want them to be. And that's something that we're looking at in the UK at the moment. Do you see it more as an economic entity rather than a political and, and, and social and cultural entity? I think it's a whole range of, of different entities. The economics is a strong area. Um, as I said, dealing with some of the big challenges like climate change, foreign policy is a, an area where it's quite important too. Okay. Uh, your foreign secretary in July of this year launched a comprehensive audit of European Union powers. Yeah. There's been talk of... EU uh, competence creep. Where is this going to lead? 
Well, I think that's what I was describing when I said that we need to find the, the right connect between Europe and its institutions and the people. Mm. So we're conducting this review of competences, as you say. I think our ministers will want to see some kind of um, settlement which has the consent of the people. How that consent is given, whether it's done through a, a referendum or through a, the manifesto going into an election, which would give the public an opportunity to, to have their say. Mm. I think precisely that articulation remains to be seen, but mm. as, as you say, we're having that, um, that discussion right I, now. Is it in response to anything in particular? Is it in response to, and you were suggesting there, that the public are not exactly engaging in a lot of these European processes as much as they could do? Is, is this, a this a government response to a perception that UK citizens want to see greater, a greater return of sovereignty to their own government? I think there's a, a tide of disillusion among citizens, not just in the UK, across um, many European countries. If you do opinion polling on individuals, um, it will vary from country to country, depending on uh, the length of the relationship, how they perceive the, 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 the direct benefits and, the, and the, any disbenefits. Mm. Um, but I think it's a challenge for all of us, and I think it's a challenge for all big organisations and institutions in the world anyway. Mm. So one thing I would say, though, at the at the people-to-people -people level, and I mentioned right at the beginning the very close cultural ties between uh, Britain and Australia, which flow from people-to-people -people links. Actually, we've seen a huge growth in those links within Europe, too. If you look at um, Britain, for example, after um, the East European countries joined, half a million Poles moved to live in Britain, because Britain is one of the most open countries in the European Union. Mm. That's a huge absorption and a huge contribution by Britain, of course, mm. to the the integration. I'm told that there are so many French people living in London now that London is the sixth largest city in France. <laughs> when we hosted that fantastic Olympic Games um, this summer, there were over 50 of the teams there who had more than 10,000 of their compatriots living permanently in Britain mm. to cheer them on. Mm. So Britain is not a, a, a single citizenry any more than you described how Australia had changed yes. as it welcomed in um, the Italian communities, yes. subsequent communities, and now I think every 12th Australian is from Asia, and that's very visible if you walk around the streets. Yes. So all the time our societies are evolving. Jean, it is a paradox that at the same time that we talk about greater integration and a, and a larger Europe, we are also seeing more independence thrusts from within Europe. Uh, there has been uh, just recently, some weeks ago, a push for the region of Catalonia for independence from Spain. It's a recurring push. Uh, Scotland's voted for more independence from the UK. It's uh, no secret that uh, in Italy some from the north would love to separate from the south. Um, how, significant, how much significance can we draw from this? Is it just more of the same that we've seen throughout uh, history? And, or, or does it have a real impact on the potential for greater EU integration? Well, I think it's historical. I mean, there have always been regions that have had uh, specific connotations, and it's, it's recurrent, I mm. mean, this, this sort of uh, uh, movements. Uh, what it means within uh, 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 the EU, I mean, that is, I mean, the, all these uh, uh, regional realities are anyway part of the EU. Mm. I mean, there is even an argument, I mean, that has been sometimes developed that within the EU, actually, these uh, sort of diversities have found, uh, let's say, a new vent for their expression. Mm. Because it's anyway all encompassed within the EU. Mm. And so when you see that there is this other level, then you, you may start to think, you know, I would like to have more of an autonomy. And so uh, uh, I sort of take a stance which actually would, uh, uh, let's say, uh, enfeeble the relationship with the a state to which I uh, am part of. And mm. so in the meantime, I'm linked uh, to the EU and anyway, it all happens in, in this context. Mm. The unemployment figures just came out of Europe recently. They are very worrying. Uh, some of the worst numbers we've seen for quite a while in Europe. How much is the economic problems in Europe affecting the push for uh, greater integration within the EU? Is, is that a problem? do you think, de dealing with that? Or as David has told us, I think, throughout the uh, series, uh, do you think there is, on the whole, an acknowledgement that really more Europe is, the, is really the best way to deal with the economic challenges that are facing Europe at the moment? 
Well, uh, we need to uh, progress uh, on the fiscal consolidation. That is the, uh, let's say, the, pre the, the prerequisites then for achieving growth. Mm. So it's essential to continue on this path. And, Europe, and, and the EU is essential, yeah. Yeah, it's essential. to achieve yeah. that. Yeah. David, I said to you before we came up on the stage before that it had been a tough year for Europe this year and you said to me it had been a very good year uh, for Europe and it, uh, I suppose, led me to think that um, out of the ashes of this devastating financial crisis, opportunity has driven, uh, I think in your view, uh, potential for greater expansion and integration from the European Union. Yeah, that's right. I, I think. I think it has been a good year because uh, we have seen very clearly that European leaders and European parliaments, European governments and the European peoples have been taking extremely difficult, serious measures to address the huge challenge of the economic crisis. I mean, it is, it is, uh, this is a, a major crisis very serious and the measures to address it are likewise major and serious. So I think in this sense it has been a very good year and you can look at um, you can look at the concern about growth for example, the, the compact on jobs and growth which was agreed in, in June uh, which is a package of 120 billion euro of investment uh, precisely to uh, address um, issues of of youth unemployment in particular, job creation and so on. But that's side by side with other measures to increase competitivity, to uh, uh, free up uh, labour markets across Europe, to have a better business environment uh, in, in, in certain member states. There's a whole range of reforms that's ongoing. Mm. And if we didn't have these uh, reforms and these very tough measures, then I would say uh, we should be more. Uh, we would. We, we should be more worried. If I could make just a couple of points in relation to to uh, points that Paul made mm. earlier, um, I think when looking at the question of um, European citizens and and how they feel about the European Union and so on, I think there is one issue that we have to front up, which is that. In life, there is only one political space in which all political issues get played out. And if in your own country um, there is any sort of issue of uh, distrust or mistrust of politicians, mm. then that affects all issues. There isn't a separate category where people feel, oh, I distrust with all due refer, uh, respect to, to, to Richard, <laughs> that anyone would ever distrust a politician. But <coughs> there isn't... Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. There isn't one, you know, people don't mistrust politicians on this issue and trust them fully on that issue. Mm. If, if there's mistrust of politicians, then there's a problem. Mm. Now, this is a particular problem in European <coughs> countries because, of course, how the European Union itself is also part of that mix. It's mm. part of that perception. So um, I think there is a general issue uh, of, uh, of a political nature in terms of um, the system being close to the citizens. And that's something that we all need to address. That's one point. And the second point is that um, we also have to be very careful to respect the different political cultures mm. uh, across countries because the union covering 27, not 28 countries. I mean, there's a vast range of different political cultures at work there. Um, happy accident, I happen to come from a country where to hold a referendum on issues is a normal thing. Mm. There are other uh, colleagues uh, that I have for whom a referendum is, uh, not, uh, is not foreseen in the Constitution. Mm. There are all sorts of different ways, and we have to grapple with, with all of this. And I, I, I would also agree with Paul that, um, and this is one reason why I think, again, it's, it's been a good year. What we've seen this year is that the very deep political discussion about Europe mm. is a discussion that we're currently having. Mm. And I think this is great mm. because 
I believe that the European Union, when properly explained, warts and all, is a great project and can win uh, the vote in whatever shape or form that mm. vote has to come. Mm. I think Jean, uh, I? Uh, yes, take it in turns. I think Jean was going to say something, but uh, and then afterwards, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to add it. Of course, it's essential that uh, we all work together to strengthen what we call the European political space mm. uh, in order to allow all European subjects, I mean, public and private, mm. to engage on crucial issues. And also, I mean, if you look at the uh, Westerwelle report, there are proposals there, I mean, in perspective on how to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, stimulate that or, make, or give this sense of uh, uh, identity with the institutions to the, to the citizens of Europe. Mm -hmm. So there are ideas of uh, introducing a um, to, of reserving a quota of members of the European Parliament uh, to a constituency which, which would be a pan-European constituency. There are uh, ideas also in the sense of giving the uh, um, European Parliament the power to uh, introduce bills and so on. So mm. there, there is an area there on which uh, we should, I think, all engage in the future in perspective to strengthen the institutions and to uh, sort of root the sense of, uh, let's say, of... Uh, um, of identity uh, uh, with the institutions and the citizens. Mm. Paul? I was actually going to come in on the first um, part of David's comment, which is about the economy, because I think sometimes there's a tendency here to completely write off Europe because of its current economic difficulties. And I don't want to be Panglossian, because clearly we've got challenges. We need to get our debt down. We need to sort out the Eurozone. We need to restore our um, competitiveness to get the growth. But you would be very foolish to write off the uh, part of the world which is the largest, richest single market, which has some of the leading companies in almost every sphere of activity, which has in, it great, in its great universities some of the most important um, innovation R&D going on, which is after all going to be the foundation mm. for the future growth of the world economy. So I think it's very much shorthand to suggest that Europe is the past economically. Mm. Uh, Richard. I, I, I suppose there'd be some states who would disagree with this, but we don't quite have the regional diversity in Australia that uh, we see in Europe. But nonetheless, we do have some similar tensions between different levels of political power, state and federal political power. Is there anything a country like Australia can learn from uh, <coughs> such an integrated entity as the EU in dealing with those mm. multiple levels of political power and sharing and, and operating, heaven forbid, in the, in the common interest mm. of all of us? No, I definitely think there is, and, 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 and there may well be uh, experiences that we have that, in a sense, we can share with Europe. But uh, the, w when you're looking at uh, the coming together of, group, uh, of people who have... Uh, many identities, and we, we all have a number of identities. You know, uh, of course, most important for me is I come from Geelong, um, and David's done a very good <laughs> thing in wearing the Geelong tie, and mostly things are secondary after that. But we, um, but there is, uh, you know, where, your town, your state, and your nation, and how they all come together in the one person uh, is, is gives rise, I guess, to where people put their emphasis in terms of government, um, and uh, and and how you can. Uh, come together with a common good in a way which does maintain identity, identity for Queenslanders, identity for West Australians. Um, so, I mean, they are issues that we have been grappling with uh, yeah. from day one, and we are, you're right, we're seeing this on a much grander scale in Europe about how to come together for the common good yeah. um, in a way which does maintain a sense of identity and nationality uh, for those within. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, th th I mean, we're at different... Uh, stages, as it were, and, and, and different levels, but there uh, is, I think, experience that we have in Australia which can be shared, and I think there are uh, experiences that are being had in Europe that we can learn from. Mm. We have to wrap this conversation up. Uh, David Daly is going to make a, a bit of a formal acknowledgement as this is the end of the series in just a moment. Before we do that, will you please thank our uh, four guests today, His Excellency Mr David Daly, the Ambassador of the European Union, His Excellency Mr Paul Madden, High Commissioner of the United Kingdom, His Excellency Mr Jean Ludovico Di Martino Di Montegiorno, the Ambassador of Italy, hey. and the Parliamentary Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Richard Miles. It's been a great series, uh, David, and I'm mm -hmm. more than happy to hand it over to you to uh, make some final closing comments and thank yous. 
Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I, I'd firstly like to, to agree. It has been a great series. Um, we've been celebrating the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Europe and, and Australia. Um, it's been a lot of work. Uh, I know very well that nothing happens of its own accord. Um, there's been a lot of work on the part of many. Um, I'd like to thank uh, very much uh, Professor Jacqueline Lowe and uh, her team here at the ANU Centre for European Studies. Uh, I'd like to thank the, um, the team of Professor Bruce Wilson uh, at the European Centre at RMIT University in Melbourne, uh, and also uh, Professor uh, Pascaline uh, Winond and Professor Natalie Doyle at Monash at the Europe Centre there for also having participated and hosted uh, this uh, series. Um, I'd like to thank all of the, the, the wonderful Australian uh, colleagues who've been able to, to give their time and, and their expertise and their experience of Europe uh, on the panel over the course of uh, now 11 months. I mean, we had the first one in February and it's been going once mm. a month since then, which is an incredible achievement. Um, of course, uh, great thanks to, to the journalists and to the media, to Sky News, Paul Bongiorno, but last and certainly not least to Paul Barclay and to uh, Karen from ABC Big Ideas. Um, this is a, a program which I have been accosted on uh, in the street almost, where people say, ah, I heard you on the radio, <laughs> or I heard, was it you or was it the French ambassador? Ah, yeah. All through the year. And uh, I've been happily, you know, glowing with with all of this uh, <laughs> thanks and so on. But I would like to pay a particular thanks to the man uh, who, who first came to me with the idea, who, that is my excellent deputy, Andrea Nicolai, deputy mm. head of the delegation of the European Union mm. here in Canberra. And I know that uh, success has many fathers, um, but I know equally that Andrea is in my eyes uh, very much uh, a key father of this success project mm. and also uh, Roger and the others mm. in, in, in the delegation. Mm. So thank you all very, very much. It's been a great year and it's been a great project. Can I just also finish up by making a, a comment as well? Um, I want to thank the ambassadors for their participation in this series. This is not normally something I know that ambassadors do a great deal of, sitting up in front of journalists and uh, letting me ask them all sorts of tricky questions in a very tricky year with, uh, you know, questions that don't really have simple answers. I want to thank them very much. I can see a few of them in the audience today. It's been a pleasure you. meeting you. Uh, secondly, this is not by any stretch an area of expertise for me. Uh, you know, I've travelled through Europe, I read the papers, but I by no means pass myself off as a European scholar. I want to thank my producer, Karin Zivanovic, who is European and who is German, and without whom uh, I would have been completely at sea, and everybody else who's uh, helped me navigate these uh, complex and unfamiliar waters of the European Union. Uh, I suppose, as is appropriate coming along to the ANU, this series has been truly an education for me uh, as well. So. Thanks to all of you, and I hope that uh, you've all got something out of it. I know our audience has, as, Rod, as, um, as David has said, uh, we've been getting some terrific feedback on the series as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, do we have time for some questions, or are we running a little late? Uh, we, we have had taken some questions in the past, but we are maybe a bit short of time. I, maybe, and Paul has to go fairly soon, and so yeah, does, we'll so does Richard. Off. Perhaps we might have to just let you mingle afterwards and, uh, yeah. and ask the questions if you can Directly. sneak them in. Okay, thank you.